Center. And I just love Julie as well. So ladies, please take it away. Sherry, I think we're gonna start with you tonight. Tracing family history, finding your Kentucky ancestors. As previously mentioned, I'm Sherry Daniels and I'm the head of Library and Archives here at the Kentucky Historical Society. So let's begin with something really basic. What is genealogy? Well, the definition of genealogy is pretty straightforward. One, it's an account of the descent of a person, family, or group from an ancestor or from older forms. Two, regular descent of a person, family, or group of organisms from a progenitor or older form, i.e. a pedigree. Three, the study of family pedigrees. And four, an account of the origin and historical development of something. So as you can tell, I mentioned the word pedigree. So genealogy is sometimes a little bit more focused on going back in time or how far you can go back in time by recording, usually on a chart, the ancestors that you can find. But what is family history? Is it the same thing? The family historian is more concerned with the why and the how of our family's past instead of focusing on the lineage alone. Quote, if you can understand the forces which shaped men's lives, then you can better understand those men. That's a quote by Val Greenwood. In other words, all family history is contextual and it cannot be viewed in isolation or separated from its historical framework. So what does that mean for you? The catch is both strategies are necessary to gather the information needed to not only fill in your pedigree, but to pass on a complete history of your family. So you need to put on the hat of being a genealogist, but you also need to understand that historical context in order to fill in the tree with your family history. So getting started, first generation strategy, always start with yourself and work backwards. Record what you know, and then delve into research that will help you identify the ancestors that came before you. Cite sources from the very first facts you collect. This is very important. You need to begin with good habits. Keep your information organized. That's also very important because you will be surprised at how much you gather from a very short period of time. Keep things simple. Keep yourself focused. And don't worry about how far back you can go, but how solid your research must be. As I said, begin with yourself. So me, myself, and I, how would you document yourself? You want to begin by recording what you know about yourself and your family unit. Use this opportunity to think about and gather documents that would prove the facts you list. What documents can you gather that prove you existed? Raid the family archives. Ask lots of questions. This is a good time to start gathering some of those family stories and gathering some of your own memories as part of your quest. Don't forget, as I said, document yourself. Birth certificates, marriage certificates, um, obituaries for those family members who have passed on, school records, military records, old photos, books, and Bibles. Start there. That's actually a really fun place to begin. Here's another way that I look at it. If you take yourself as ancestor one, try to focus on the basic things. Um, and I know I've got death on here. You're not deceased yet, but <laughs> start with the basic things. And you can use this for any ancestor that you move forward with. So you want to gather the basic things, birth, marriage, milestones or careers, and death, things that you might have access to in your family home. Then you want to move on to other records that are available out there, such as census records, taxes, deeds, court records, probate, wills, estate records. And as you get started, you want to be familiar with the tools of the trade. One great way to do this, and a very simple way to do this, is look up something called a family group sheet and even ancestral or pedigree charts. A family group sheet, there are loads of them out there for free online. Just Google that, print one out, grab a pencil, and start recording the pieces of information that the form is asking for, such as names, dates, locations, 
family relationships. In fact, a family group sheet is going to begin with you, your spouse, children, um, and then it's going to include parents and the dates associated with every one of those people plus locations. So it's a really simple way to do that. Now, there are digital ways to do this, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. Organization system, choose that now. Do some research, do some homework on the organizational systems out there and that are available for family genealogy research. You'll be glad that you did. Family tree software, Absolutely, there's loads of choices out there and I'm going to cover that in just a second. Online databases. So many people get started with online databases, but I encourage you to step back, begin with yourself, document what you can, then move on to the online databases for folks that predate you, i.e. your ancestors. Vital records and census. That's another great one to track your ancestors going back in time, usually every 10 years. And just a tip, we have the 1950 census will be released to the public for the first time on April 1st of 2022. So any of your ancestors that lived in 1950 should be able to be discovered in this new resource that's coming out. So stay tuned for more information about that. Educational material. There are so many options out there. Free videos and resources. In fact, there's just one example right here to the right. Um, that picture is of Roots Tech. The RootsTech.org conference has tons of free videos up there just from this year. And we at the Kentucky Historical Society also have a free YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel and take a look at the genealogy videos we have up online. Do yourself a favor. Look into the options you have for digital family tree making software. Um, numbering is automatic. You have reports and charts that you can print out. Some of them even have phone apps that you can take with you. And a lot of the calculations are already made in there. So if you've got a numbering or like a year date error that you've got in your tree, these things will flag it for you. And also importing citations are so much easier with an, with an electronic or a digital format. So do yourself a favor, research some of those. Most of them have a free version out there that you can download and test drive. And I do recommend test driving because each person has preferences or ways that they like to work. And each one of these may be slightly different. So you might resonate with one of them. But what about those online world trees? Those are actually a very good option. One of the things to remember though, as with any world trees out there, just be careful about ones you're already using for research. They can be, uh, they can be full of a lot of errors, um, but there are some really great online world trees where you don't have to download the software yourself. So do a little homework on that as well. Terms of the trade, learn the lingo. All of these things here that you see, you're going to have to know what these documents are and why you need them to document your family. Census records, will, probate, estate settlements, vital statistics, deeds, church baptismal records, death certificates, mortality schedules, land warrant, patents, grants, obituaries, family Bible records, court records, city directories. Be patient with yourself. You will learn these as you go along but be on the lookout for different terms that you may need to know. As I mentioned before, review your citation standards now. Um, it's always helpful to kind of pick which one you like and then stick with it so that as you import your citations into whatever family tree maker software you use, you're using the same format. Now, a lot of people use Evidence Explained, which is already based off of another one of the well-known formats that we have out there, but historians often use Turabian, you could use Chicago, MLA, whatever you are familiar with and comfortable with, pick it and stick with it. This is a little bit more of an advanced tip, but I want you to put this on your radar, especially as we move into the winter months and you want something to read before you maybe head out on the road this spring to start looking for your ancestors. Um, be looking at the genealogical proof standard. It's a pretty easy five-step process that helps you be responsible in your research. It talks about a reasonably exhaustive search, complete and accurate citation of your sources, analysis and correlation of the collected information, resolution of conflicting evidence, and soundly reasoned, coherently written conclusions. And these conclusions are not all of your genealogy. We're talking about the conclusion or an argument about 
proving one aspect of your genealogy. Let's say you have an ancestor that several people have reported it's a different person. Well, you gather the documents, you follow the GPS, and then you write an argument about why you believe this person that you have found is the correct one. So, but it's a very, very good thing to have in your mind that as you build your family tree to make sure that the information you're gathering is correct. Online databases, as I said, so many people use these. The ones with asterisks there, those denote subscription-based databases that are available for free here in the Kentucky Historical Society Library. Um, Ancestry is one of the most popular, but it is subscription-based. You have to pay to use that or go to a library where it's free. FamilySearch.org is a free resource and a top competitor of Ancestry, so try that when you get there. They also have a one-world tree that you can contribute your information to. Um, all the others here that you see, most of these are free for you to use online. Except for, as you can see, Fold3, that's also a subscription-based. You would need to pay to use that, which is military-based, by the way, um, or find a library that has that. We have that one here in the library, so if anyone's in the area, come see us, and you can use that while you're here on site. Database tips. You will find many different kinds of information out there. Keep your searches simple. Use multiple spellings of surnames. Try to connect to an image of the actual document needed. Take the research of others with a grain of salt. Look for those citations. Just because you see it in an online tree does not mean that it is true. Make sure that when you're looking at someone else's information that you take a look at their citations, take a look at the sources that prove the relationship. Branching out. I know so many people love those online databases, but it's literally only the tip of the iceberg. You need to branch out and go off site for some of your research. Now let's take a look at Kentucky-specific research. We are a land of many counties. Our official statehood began in 1792, but of course we had settlers, European settlers, coming in earlier than that. At present, we have 120 counties, but prior to that, in fact, going back pre-statehood, we were indigenous lands, um, and then we were part of Virginia, and then we evolved into 120 counties. So that's a lot of research to consider. We had a lot of shifting boundaries over all of those years, variable record keeping, courthouse disasters. Where do you find what you need? You need to do your homework. So where do you find it? Obviously, there are various places you can go, courthouses, libraries, historical societies, state archives. By the way, the State Historical Society and the State Archives are both here in Frankfurt. So this is a great town to come look for your Kentucky ancestors, especially because both of us collect on all 120 counties. There are other government offices. The Secretary of State Land Office is an amazing resource with early land records and um, digitized free images. Office of Vital Statistics for some of those birth and death certificates. Universities, don't forget universities. They have loads of wonderful archival collections. Homework one, county considerations. A lot of records in Kentucky are arranged by county, so you need to try to find out which county your Kentucky ancestors lived in. Which one do you really need? Narrow down the possibilities whenever possible. Take a look at the date of formation for the county plus the parent counties and that might give you a target area. But not so fast. Don't forget about the shifting boundaries. There are many decades of musical county lines. In fact, here's one atlas that we use here in the library quite often, and it is, um, it's an atlas of Kentucky County boundaries, and it shows you very detailed maps of where those boundaries shifted over time, even with water courses and little towns on those maps. Um, there are some ways that you can see, or there's some, there are some offerings online where you can see those shifts, um, like Newberry is one of them, it's a free resource, and it can show you in an animation form where there's these boundary shift but not as detailed as say this atlas another one where to find what you need this is a great resource it's a book called Kentucky Ancestry by Roseanne Rhinemuth Hogan um, it is out of print but if you can get a used copy online or look in your library more than likely your library is going to have a copy this is a book that 
the first half gives you the information on how, when, and where documents were created in Kentucky, which is super educational. The second part of the book has um, a county by county list of the records that are available per county. And the little symbols there can tell you where you can find those. Now it's not fully comprehensive and I still tell people to go look at our library catalog to see what records we do have. Because sometimes in this book um, it lists that maybe we only have part of them when we, we actually have a larger collection than how we're represented. But again, it's still a wonderful resource. It also includes courthouse fires, floods, um, which is really great to give you the time frame of when a courthouse disaster happened, that can be a key to finding the records or to understanding when there's a gap in the records. Um, one thing to note though, it also includes those local agency addresses. It was published in 1992, so please don't use that if you're going to use that for, um, for an address or to go on a trip. Please double check their online information before making a visit. What do we have here at the Kentucky Historical Society? Well, we are home to the largest genealogy collection in the state, and we have so many pieces of information that can help you find your Kentucky ancestors. We've been collecting since 1836, and here's just a sampling of some of the things that we have. We have family histories and surname files, over 30,000 surname files to be exact, family Bibles, special collections and archives, photographs, diaries, letters, artifacts, county, state histories, church records, oral histories, city directories, how-to genealogy books, lineage books. We're open under our general admission, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. And remember, if you're a member, it's free admission to the entire campus. Don't forget to visit our website at history.ky.gov in order to see some of our online offerings and to look through our library catalog. When you get to the main page, you want to hover over the Explore section at the very top, and this box will appear, and the choice you want is Resources. That's going to take you to a list of all of the catalogs we have available online, which you definitely need to take advantage of. There are many that are free databases in here that have actual resources you can take a look at. Now our library catalog is going to be just a list of the items we have in the library. It's not going to have the contents of the books or the materials. However, kyhistory.com is going to give you digital images of select items from our archive, including family Bible records. So that's going to be one of the resources that you can literally go to and see original records for free from the comfort of your home. Here's another list, um, Kentucky Ancestors Online. That's our free genealogy publication. Please go there and learn some more about researching Kentucky ancestors. Um, as I'd mentioned before, our digital collections catalog, kyhistory.com. We have loads of resources there. That's the place where I said you have digital images of original material from our archives, such as letters, diaries, photographs, and yes, family Bible records. Um, Pass the Word is a site that gives you listings of oral history interviews throughout the state. And then Civil War Governors of Kentucky is another place that you're going to find original documents in digital format in order to find your Kentucky ancestors. And again, all free. If you want to learn some more, we also have a brand new TV show out. Season one just aired earlier this year, but you can see every episode on our YouTube channel. This is really, really a fun series. And right now we are taking applications for folks who have Kentucky-based family history mystery. If you'd like to submit your Kentucky-based family history mystery for our researchers to solve for season three, you can go to KentuckyAncestors.org and just click on the top banner. Scroll through, there'll be some clicks you need to get through, but you will eventually get to a form that lets you submit that information. And by the way, help us out, we also have a new Facebook group called Kentucky Ancestors. Just look for that. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier on when I talked about the county formation list, the parent county formation list, um, that handout was just posted to our Facebook group. Um, so you can grab that anytime. One last tip that I have for you, time considerations. Always lower your result expectations. Remember that genealogy research is as much about recording where you looked as it is about recording when you found something. So be on the lookout for some research logs. So you keep track of where you're searching, what you found, or what you did not find.
Keep realistic time goals. When you're out on the road visiting libraries, or even if you're sitting down in front of a computer, don't do this in an impatient state. Plan ahead, budget your time wisely. Always remember that research is a time-consuming process, but it's also really fun. So enjoy yourself, be responsible with your research, cite those sources, you'll be glad that you did, and let's get going. Your ancestors are waiting. Thank you, Sherry, for that presentation. Um, I do want to remind everyone watching to submit their questions for Sherry in the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, and we're going to be taking your questions uh, for Sherry uh, in just a little bit. Um, before we hear from our next speaker, though, uh, we have a history trivia question for you tonight. Um, so let's see if you can identify the correct answer. Um, I've given I've given you some multiple choice options tonight, and let's see. Do we have a slide with that question on there? I'll pop that up there. Hopefully, it will be easier. <laughs> there we go. I think we should have that. Ah, there we go. Thank you. So. On November 16, 1798, the, the Kentucky General Assembly passed the first of two Kentucky resolutions, penned anonymously by then Vice President Thomas Jefferson, and introduced into the Kentucky House of Representatives by his friend John Breckinridge. The Kentucky resolutions denounced this recently passed federal law under which Jefferson feared prosecution if his authorship were known. So which of the which which federal law are we looking for here? Is it A, the Fugitive Slave Act, B, the Alien and Sedition Acts, or C, the Missouri Compromise? So you can just put A, B, or C in the chat there. We'll see how you guys do. Jill says B. Sheila says maybe A. Got a couple more B answers. Oh, but A is a popular choice as well. <laughs> oh, there was a C as well, Missouri Compromise. All right, I'll go ahead and tell you guys the correct answer is B, the Alien and Sedition Acts. That was passed um, uh, in 1797 by the US Congress and um, it, uh, a lot of people really opposed it. Um, and so um, Jefferson and also Madison decided that they would get some state legislatures to pass resolutions to condemning um, uh, and basically denouncing these laws. And so one of the states that did so was Kentucky. Um, and also, and then Vir Thomas Jefferson wrote those resolutions that Kentucky passed. Um, Virginia also passed resolutions. Um, sometimes they're referred to together. Uh, and Madison penned those. Um, so yeah, that, that happened on this day in 1798. We passed those resolutions. Okay, so um, I am going to turn it over now to Julie Kemper, our curator of object learning. And um, I'm gonna be filming her um, while she shows you some artifacts here in our collection storage. Um, area and uh, talks about how to best care for those items. So I'm going to mute my right, I muted the computer. Okay. All right. So we need what do I need to decide? Oh, it's not very big. Ha <laughs> ha, how about that? <laughs> All right. I'm gonna go on the side of them. <clears throat> Can I hear us all right? Can you guys hear us all right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Turn up the volume. Just that top one right there. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yes. Okay. 
All right, well, thanks for joining, uh, joining us this evening. Um, Sherry is sort of on the archival side uh, in our institution here. I'm more on the object side, uh, but since she talked a lot about gathering family documents, I thought I might do a brief um, overview on making sure you take good care of those things. Um, and she can correct me when I'm wrong. How about that? <laughs> um, so I'll start uh, with uh, some basics uh, that really goes for anything. It doesn't matter if it's a piece of paper, if it's a piece of fabric, if it's a piece of wood, piece of leather, um, anything. Um, you want to think about what is going to damage something over time. So number one is light. Um, that includes heat from the sun will also do that. Um, you also want to think about um, the air around something. So um, you wanna make sure that you keep things um, that are not in rooms with fireplaces that you use a lot. I know that sounds kind of crazy, um, but the soot from a fireplace that you use all winter long can make a difference. Um, also, temperature is a big um, important thing to think about, both temperature and humidity. And everyone always asks, well, what's the best temperature? What's the best humidity? Um, the truth is the worst thing for temperature humidity is big changes quickly. Um, so I, when you are thinking about where to store your family heirlooms, um, you don't want to keep them in a place like the attic, which is really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter and can make huge changes just within a day or two. I mean, think about Kentucky's weather, right? Um, so you want to choose a place um, that does keep a fairly average temperature. Um, and th those are just some of the basics. Um, <clears throat> another one of those is think about the material that is touching your items. Um, so we're always going to want to think about materials that have uh, little or no acid, natural acid in them. Um, think about a newspaper. You keep a newspaper around for a couple of months, it turns yellow. It's because that paper is has a lot of acid in it. So when you're thinking about keeping um, your documents as you're doing your research, whether it be your birth certificate, birth certificate, or maybe grandfather's military records, um, a basic box like this, an archival box, is a great thing to invest in. Um, it is acid-free cardboard. Um, this actually is records from um, our Churchill Weavers collection, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, and inside are folders that are also acid free. Um, one thing that's really important if you choose to use a box is when you're first starting out and you only have a few things in your box, um, make sure you add support. Um, so if you, I'm gonna take a few of these out here in order so I know what order to put them back. So if you think about only having say um, two or three folders over time, them leaning over in the box one way or the other, it's actually gonna cause um, those documents to curl over time. So you can put um, some kind of cardboard in here, um, anything that's going to help take up the interior space so these documents remain flat. Okay, I'm gonna move this over here. Inside your folders, a lot of times we run into, is this one that has one? Nope, I'm gonna pull one that does. There we go. Inside your folders, you can have multiple documents, though again, do think about what those documents are made from. If they're all from the same type of paper or material, you're fine. But you don't wanna stick a newspaper in with say typing paper um, because there are, those acids are going to be uh, problematic. Um, also, if you run into any staples, very carefully <laughs> remove the staples. I, re I recommend a pair of tweezers is always a good way um, to take out the staples. And if you, but if you still need to keep them together, I thought there was one in here. No, maybe not. Uh, here we go. If you do need to keep them together, do not use metal paper clips, use plastic paper clips. And don't try to put too many together at once or you really will create a permanent crease. But you can use, and you can see in this one, oh, you can see that little dent right there. That's from a metal paper clip right there. Um, so plastic paper clips are much better. Um, even though modern paper clips don't rust as badly as um, one safe from the 1950s, <laughs> which we find quite a bit, um, you still want to be able to um, 
protect your papers um, as much as possible. I will put these back later, but I'm gonna put them back in the right order. <laughs> um, so uh, we also another option, if you don't wanna go with an, a standing box um, is to actually put um, some, some materials in plastic sleeves. Um, this is just a plain plastic um, bag <laughs> without a lid. It's a poly material. Um, you can find these online. The nice thing is that um, family record keeping has become so popular. You can find these at a lot of different places. Um, a lot of um, art supply stores carry these now. And so just look for things that are archival quality is the key. They're not very expensive, as expensive as they used to be. So this is a poly bag. Um, you can also use our, and polypropylene. Um, so this is mylar. It's a little bit thicker. You can feel that it sound here that it sounds like a little thicker. Um, and notice that um, this is sealed on the bottom uh, and sealed on the side, but not sealed on the other two sides. Um, that is a change in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so that we no longer seal documents because you're then you're trapping moisture on the inside, you want to you want to keep them open. And these are also things that um, you can buy with them already sealed, or you can buy sheets and uh, use uh, tape, um, archival tape, double stick tape um, to seal them as well. Um, a lot of folks ask about photographs. <sighs> there are so many options for that. I'm actually not gonna go into a lot of detail tonight, but I will tell you, please do not use the albums with the sticky sheets. <laughs> please do not use the albums with the sticky sheets. Um, you can um, buy photo albums that have the plastic type sleeves that you slip them in, but you don't wanna use anything that has an adhesive of any kind. Um, you can use photo corners if you choose to, but make sure the paper you're putting them on is acid free. Um, another thing about acid free paper, um, it's also good to separate in your files. You can use acid free paper in between things um, and you can literally buy that off a supply store. Um, our acid free paper it just looks like typing paper, but it's acid free. Um, so that's our quick cover of archival materials. Um, and now we're gonna move on to um, one of my favorites, textiles. See, yeah, we have a whole bunch of artifacts up here. That's right. <laughs> um, so when it comes to objects, the number one question we get about how do I take care of grandma's blank um, is textiles. Um, we often get questions about clothing, especially wedding dresses. We also get questions about quilts a lot. How do we take care of these? So I'm gonna cover just a couple of basics um, on taking care of quilts and clothing. Um, there's lots of other materials out there. If you have any questions, you're welcome to send me an email and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Um, but it still goes back to our basics. You wanna keep them away from light, especially direct sunlight. You want to keep them in a good temperature and humidity environment, and you want to keep them away from acid materials. And we're talking about fabric, you also need to watch other fabrics, um, because if you decide to wrap um, your mother's wedding dress in a sheet with a floral print, you have the possibility that the dyes from the sheet could transfer to the dress. So anytime you're using other fabric to fabric, make sure that they are, um, they are of a solid white, preferably unbleached, um, but certainly not any colors. We're not running out of battery, are we? No, I think okay, we're good. Great. Um, okay, so in our nice acid-free box here, um, you can buy boxes like these online. They are a little expensive, um, but if you have something that's particularly uh, dear to you, it might be worth investing in one. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use a plastic box that is lined with acid-free tissue, and I'll cover the tissue in a second, but do not seal it because when you seal something and keep all the air trapped in, you're creating a micro environment that could potentially grow mold. So you don't wanna do that. However, you do wanna keep it enclosed enough that you don't get moths in and things like that. Do you please, don't use mothballs. <laughs> Please don't use mothballs. <laughs> you don't want anything like the mothballs directly next um, to your clothing. Um, same thing with cedar. You don't want the cedar touching the clothing. If it's in the same closet, you're pretty good, but 
All right, so this is an acid free box. It's not my favorite type because it's hard to open I like the other kind. Um, so this dress here, you can see what we've done is um, you, this is acid free tissue. You can buy it in sheets. You can also buy it in rolls. Most likely at home, you buy one pack um, that's gonna be more enough more than enough. Um, this is probably a little overstuffed, to be honest with you. Everybody has their own way. I particularly chose this dress um, because you can see where it has had light, dam light damage already. Um, it was, it might have been on display. I don't think this light damage is from actually being used um, because it's just a little too um, consistent. Uh, I'm going to move, uh, switch your places if I okay. might. Um, so, um, if you can see, there was definitely the belt closed around here, and that's why you see lots of light damage here and here. Um, it was probably on display just on one side. The back has much less um, fading, uh, and so it was definitely facing a window as or, or facing outward on display as compared to someone wearing it. it would have had more fading. The fading would have been more regular. This is such a great dress. How old is this dress, Jane? Um, this is probably um, this is probably about 1900. Um, it what's interesting is that um, it is actually hand stitched, um, but the the collar and so on. Um, I wouldn't put it any earlier than say 1890. Um, but you can see the hand stitching there. And then even on the buttonholes, those are hand stitched buttonholes. Now, of course, machines were well around by then, um, but a lot of people were still um, sewing by hand, um, either, either for finer dresses, they wanted to make sure it stayed together, um, or to, um, uh, because they didn't have a choice, they didn't have a sewing machine. Um, so what we've done <clears throat> is we've taken our nice tissue here, which is, comes in sheets, and we bunch it up, and we want to make sure that our dress isn't flat. Um, the idea here is to avoid really strong folds. Um, that's going to create creases that won't come out because if you fold clothing and you leave a hard crease for an extended period of time, it actually breaks the fibers eventually. Uh, they become more and more weak, um, even just rubbing around, um, and they'll eventually, that'll eventually turn into a tear. Um, this is a particularly strong fabric because this is made of cotton. Um, and uh, but so we have put stuffing in the chest area. We put stuffing in the sleeves, as you see here. Um, one thing that um, isn't really needed if you these buttons, as you can see, are shell. And actually, I think those are um, rubber buttons. Um, but if you have something with metal buttons, one thing you can do is just take a little piece of the tissue, preferably with a scissors, not your fingers. Um, and if you tear a hole in it and put the button around the hole, it would protect the fabric from the metal button. It just gives a little bit of protection so that the metal isn't somehow corroding the fabric. Um, so we're going to give it some stuffing on the inside. Um, and then we do have to fold this into a box. I mean, I would love if we could lay out every single dress that we have in our collection. That's not happening. Um, so what we're going to do is put paper wherever we are creating a fold, like this. And then the last one, just as we get it into the box. Um, we have put a layer, actually there's something else underneath, there you go. Uh, we have put a layer of paper um, underneath this and also on the inside of, of the box before that one. And uh, that's just another added layer of protection 
Um, you might have noticed when we opened the box, there was one on top as well. So let's say, for instance, this box gets wet. Uh, it's going to shed a little bit of water, but eventually the cardboard would get wet. This is just another layer. Gives it a little more time um, for you to save it before the whole thing gets wet and it starts to get all moldy and gross. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> hey Julie, can we get into some questions now? I don't know if you have a lot left, but we don't want to run out of time for the questions. Okay. Um, I let me just show you the other box because it's basically the same thing, just something larger. If that's okay. okay. Um, so this is uh, where we folded a quilt. You do the same thing as far as um, making. Um, paper, putting paper in between the folds, but um, also be a little creative about how you might put a quilt um, into your home. Um, a lot of people like to put it on display, watch the windows, um, but also think about maybe putting the quilt on a guest bed and then covering it with um, a white plain sheet when your guests aren't visiting and take it off when they arrive. Um, so then, yeah, we're ready to move to questions. Okay. Um. I'm going to um, go back to the computer. Hang on, what's, or Anisha, are you gonna do the questions from the chat? Yeah, so while you guys okay. move back to your setup, uh, okay. I wanna thank both Julie and Sherry and Carol, all three of you, uh, for all of the really, really valuable information that you have shared tonight. And I know some more is coming as we go to our questions. So Robin, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us our first question. Um, Jackie wants to know about groups like Daughters of the American Revolution. Is their information accurate as a general rule? Well, I guess I'm a little biased because I am a member of DAR actually. <laughs> so, um, you know, the thing is, I think everyone's research can be faulty over time. Um, in fact, the very first inclination that or instance where someone told me that my family I could join on one of my ancestors I was so excited I was a teenager I was really excited and I ordered the application um, from DAR to see what the lineage looked like in hopes of, of tacking on and, and joining under that one it came back just covered in red because the person who pulled it said oh this is actually not correct so even DAR they self-police quite a bit um, you know they're really good about documenting every section. I mean, when I joined, oh, about six years ago, yeah, every single piece of, I had to have a piece of paper to prove every single thing. So I think it's, and they have a whole team of genealogists now in Washington, D.C. So, you know, they're, they're a lot more stringent than they used to be. Um, or should I say, again, every, every genealogy is susceptible to some sort of a correction in the future, but uh, they're doing, they're doing a good job. Okay. Our next question, um, regarding the librarians there at, at KHS, do they train public, other public librarians to assist people with genealogical research? Yes, um, we have at least two librarians, two full-time librarians there on staff. Um, we have another professional genealogist there on staff. And so, yeah, popping in. In fact, the only people, I believe, we don't even have any volunteers staffing the desk. It's all staff. Um, and so we, we deal with research every day. So we can absolutely help you if you stop by. Okay. Um, also, how accurate are the tests, the genetic types of tests that are set to determine lineages? Ah, um, hmm. Science, Science is very reliable. So I will say that the science behind them is very good. Um, however, the tests that you get back, while these are the ethnicity results are gonna give you estimates, only estimates for the DNA, the stronger strands of DNA that survive to you. So um, they usually only go back a couple hundred years at best. That's where you start seeing some of your lower percentages. Um, but they're probably the strength in DNA testing is matching to other folks um, so that you can uncover or break through some of those brick walls or even uncover some of the branches that you just didn't know were there. Um, so that's some of the best, I'd say probably the biggest strengths with DNA testing. Okay. Um, Rita wants to know, what if a birth was never recorded due to um, a mixed race? And this was back in like 1896. How can you work around that type of roadblock? 
Well, from the time frame in Kentucky, it's really difficult for anyone actually in the 1890s. For Kentucky, um, we didn't start recording any births or deaths until 1852. And then even then it was ledger style. And by the Civil War, we stopped. We didn't pick it up again until 74. We had big gaps in the 90s. And then we didn't start uh, producing birth certificates or death certificates until 1911. So for all Kentuckians, it's a really challenging time frame. Um, in fact, my grandmother in 1920, when the law was supposed to be firmly in place, my grandmother in 1920 did not have a birth certificate filed um, just because she was born at home. Um, as far as proving that, now by 1896, you might wanna to check to see if they ever filed a delayed birth certificate. Some folks close to the 20th century like that, um, especially when you get into, they want to prove their birth for other reasons. Um, also, so the delayed birth certificates, they would be still at the Office of Vital Statistics. Again, we've seen people file delayed birth certificates from like, from that time period, from the 1890s into about 1910. So those people born in that, they might be there. Um, also too, if they were old enough, you know, over time, if they decided to um, file for social security, they had to have some sort of affidavit for birth. And so you can order the SS, I think it's the SS5 file from the National Archives for social security. That's another application packet that you might have there as well. And of course, Unfortunately, when they die, if they had a death certificate, their the birth date may be listed on there as well. And would like baptismal records be a possibility as well? They, or they can. Bibles? Family Bibles and church records, yes, can absolutely help. Um, in our in our experience, they're just not as easy to find. There's just um, <laughs> it depends on the denomination, what's available, whether the church survived and where the records went if the church did not survive. So sometimes they went to regional archives and whatnot. Okay. Uh, regarding um, the preservation of items, uh, Dave wants to know, who do you notify if you have items that you may want to donate? Sure, um, if you uh, either email using our um, online links uh, from the um, history.ky.gov, history um, you'll get in, in touch with um, one of our collections uh, staff that will walk you through the, the donation um, process, or you can also just give a call to our main number. And uh, again, we'll get you um, to someone who can help you walk through the process of making a donation. Great. Do we have any further questions? We have a few comments you might enjoy reading, but I think these are all the questions I see unless there's anything else. We do have a few more questions, Robin, in the Q&A. I don't know if you oh, see that part. I missed that, I'm sorry. Um, do deaths have to report where bodies are interred? I'm sorry, say that again. Do deaths have to report where the bodies are interred? I guess death certificates, would that information be included? Yeah, um, that's in there. Um, it should It should be. I, I think I, I do teach a class and actually I did post it to our Facebook group just recently because Halloween was coming up. And so I decided to uh, post the cemetery session. You can go watch that for free. It's on our website. I mean, it's on our Facebook group or it's on our YouTube page, but death certificates, there is a section there that records not only who, uh, who, the under, who the undertakers were, but where the body ended up being buried. Um, the only thing I, I do have a little bit of a lesson there is that while it may not make sense to you, sometimes that name is not always the actual cemetery name. It can be what it's locally known as. In fact, one of like some of my ancestors were buried in a cemetery that's known by three different names. So it should be there. <laughs> it's just, it's on the certificate, it should be. Okay, Tahisha wants to know, when you say family history mystery, does that mean you're looking for some kind of scandal? No, nope, not necessarily. Um, you know, while, while we're always game for a good story, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a genealogy show. So honestly, you know, if you've got a, a question, I'm trying to think of some of the things that we have answered um, over season one. Actually watching season one on, on YouTube will probably give you an idea of, um, of what, we, what we've solved. You know, I mean, granted, uh, while we like a good story, um, 
you know, we want something with a little meat that we can actually research and tell a story with. Sometimes we can answer a question really quickly and it just wouldn't fit, fill 20 minutes. So it's kind of a weird balance that we have to go with, but um, no, not necessarily. In fact, we've got one coming up in season two that's going to be uh, answering a question and then filling in a lineage. So. <laughs> Patricia wants to know, she says, my maternal grandparents came from Mississippi and Louisiana. Did those states have resources similar to Kentucky? They do. And in fact, um, that area, especially Louisiana, they're really strong on baptismal records, by the way. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of, the, a lot of similarities in the records, a um, lot of national similarities, especially in those databases that I was covering. Um, you know, and I'm one that I actually didn't touch on a whole lot, but newspapers, don't forget a lot of newspapers out there can also help um, with your records. So, yeah. Okay. All right, Robin, we're going to have to cut it off there. And so okay. I'm going to see if Julie and Cherry can answer some of the remaining questions in chat for everybody or in the Q&A and they can type those out. I don't think I can type. I'm on the phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. I can maybe send those to you um, and we can put them in a follow-up email afterwards. So I will go ahead and turn it back over to Deborah. All right. Can I add one little thing before we go, by the way? Um, I mentioned the rootstech.org conference. Um, Julie and I gave a session on preserving archives and heirlooms and it's probably a little bit longer it's got the both of us so we're kind of demonstrating some more it's free if you just go look for my name it'll pop up by the way <laughs> all right we can't hear you deborah but we might be able to go ahead and go to jim right now so jim if you want to Tell us about our other lifelong learning resources and we'll get our slide up on screen for you. And Jim might be frozen. All right. <laughs> Looks like I lost him there. So I will take it away. Charles, if you can put our slide on screen. So uh, as Deborah said in the beginning, this entire workshop webinar was a part of our lifelong learning initiative, ARP Kentucky Comebackers. So we wanted to share some more resources, resources for you if you want to continue learning about anything you're interested in. Um, a lot of the times life can get in the way, like we said, and so we want to provide you with some of these different opportunities to help you um, possibly go back to school. Um, but the first resource I want to tell you about is from AARP, and it's called the AARP Skills Builder for Work, and it can actually help you gain in-demand skills for today's job market. So if you are still working and wanting to gain some new skills, the Skills Builder for Work is a resource for that from AARP. Now we have a few different resources in Kentucky for adults who want to continue an education, um, more like a higher education. So the first pathway is about earning your GED or anyone you know who may want to earn their GED. There are two ways, um, two of many, I'm sure, but two ways to do that in Kentucky. So Kentucky Skills U offers free adult education services in all 120 counties of Kentucky. So no matter where you live, you can go to your local Kentucky Skills U office or center for help. Um, and they can help you prepare to take the GED. And GED Plus is a program that can allow you to earn your GED and a technical certificate at the same time. And you also might be able to take the GED test for free right now as uh, something that is going on in Kentucky, a waiver for the testing fee. The second pathway includes the resources for adults who want to earn a certificate or associate degree. With the Work Ready Kentucky Scholarship, you might qualify to earn up to 60 college credits tuition free if you already have your high school diploma or GED. And then we have Donovan Fellowship, which actually applies to associate degrees and above. So that would include a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So if you are 65 or older, you might qualify to um, have your tuition waived to take courses and work towards a degree tuition free at any state supported institution in Kentucky. And that's with Donovan Fellowship. And lastly, in addition to Donovan Fellowship and our third pathway, 
we have um, another resource in Kentucky to help you finish a bachelor's degree you may have already started. Uh, so maybe things just got in the way and you had taken some courses. And so if you have previously earned 80 or more college credits at a four year institution in Kentucky, there are some degree completion options available through Project Graduate at your institution of choice that might be uh, available to you. So you can visit aarp.org slash kycomebackers to find all of this information, learn more, and determine what matches your goals. And you can follow the links there to see if you're eligible. So I will turn it back over to Deborah if her sound's working and we'll wrap up to announce our sweepstakes winners. Thank you, Anisha. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. And before we wrap up, from this wonderful uh, enlightening session, um, we're gonna we're ready to see our giveaway winners. So, Robin, are you ready with those names? Um, I believe they were gonna be up on the screen for me, and there they are. Um, All the, right. Yes, Terry Drain, Bonnie Bedford, Gracia Garcia O'Brien, Jennifer Isle, John Sutton. Norman Harn, Joanne Parker, Stan Watson, Linda Boyman, Rose Lewis, Steve Dunn, Marilyn Roberts, Thelma Huddleston, Danny Wright, and Tracy Huff. So please be on the lookout for an, e for an email from ARP Kentucky about delivery of your prize and congratulations. Well, congratulations to all the winners. And thank you, Robin, for your help and leadership today. So as we wrap up, uh, I want to let you all know about a few upcoming events. If you're nearing 65 and want to get a better understanding of enrolling in Medicare for the first time, AARP will host a virtual meeting uh, seminar on Medicare initial enrollment, key questions to ask. That's gonna be on December 9th. So that's to help you uh, decide how you want to do things, assuming you've not been enrolled in Medicare before. So go to aarp.org slash near you to register. Uh, Carol, would you like to share any upcoming events from uh, the Kentucky Historical Society? I sure would. We are uh, really busy this time of year. We just opened a brand new exhibit, which I hope that you will come and see. It's called Illuminations, and it explores the history of light in Kentucky, um, how Kentuckians have created it and used it, used light um, at different points in our history, um, as well as the meanings that uh, Kentuckians have ascribed to it over time really cool, very interactive. So it's a great one if you've got kids or grandkids that you wanna bring with you. Um, it, uh, it opened uh, just the, uh, this past week and it will be uh, on display through um, the spring equinox, which is I believe March the 21st. So come on out and see that. Um, we also have um, some other events coming up. Um, we have a monthly speaker series, which you might enjoy. Um, called our, it's called the First Friday Speaker Series, and it's, guess what, on the first Friday of every month at noon. Um, on December 3rd, um, our speaker will be uh, Dr. Brad Asher, who is an independent researcher. He's from Louisville, and he um, has written a book about um, Do uh, General Stephen Burbridge, who was the military commander of Kentucky um, during the Civil War. Controversial figure. He did some things that a lot of Kentuckians didn't like. And so the title of his book is called, the, um, it's The Most Hated Man in Kentucky, which I think is great. Um, so that's uh, Friday, December 3rd at noon. And then the very next day, Saturday the 4th, we have a free event at the Old State Capitol here in Frankfurt. Um, a uh, gentleman uh, by the name of Winfrey Blackburn um, has just written a new biography of Gideon Schrock, um, who was the architect who designed the old state capitol. Um, he was the premier um, 
uh, Greek revival architect um, in the 19th century Kentucky. Uh, he also designed Old Morrison Hall at Transylvania University, um, as well as the Orlando Brown House here in Frankfurt. Um, I think at the Metro Hall in Louisville is also a Gideon Schrock design. Um, and so uh, he's gonna be presenting his new book um, and we'll be experiencing that within, uh, within uh, surrounded by Gideon Schrock's work. Um, so come on out, that's at three o'clock in the afternoon on December the 4th. Sa that's a Saturday as well. Sherry, did you have any other genealogy events that you wanted to share? Goodness, probably not for the end of this year. I think we're done for 2021. However, be looking on KentuckyAncestors.org for new events coming up because we're gonna start populating for 2022. We've got some free book club uh, events. We're gonna start reading some DNA related fiction, which is really fun. Uh, and then one, another book called Descendants of Slavery. So. Um, we're going to really unpack and, and dig into um, the issues of slavery and, and all of that. And so um, we've got our Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall coming up April 2nd. That's an in-person event. Our second season of the TV show starts airing in February. Um, and don't forget that 1950 census be looking. We're going to have, I know, probably some free sessions on how you can access those new census records coming out in on April 1st. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Carol, and thank you, Sherry. That concludes tonight's event. We hope you enjoyed it, and we welcome your feedback. You'll receive a link to a survey in the next few days. Please let us know about your experience. Thank you for participating, and thanks again to the K Kentucky Historical Society, and to all, have a good night.